In this segment, we will talk with the two candidates for the House of Delegates 95th district seat, the incumbent, Republican Chuck Hurst, and the challenger, Democrat Debbie Carroll. Uh, each of you will get a minute for an opening statement, and uh, we'll reverse the order for the closing statements. And uh, you can be a little bit loose with that minute. It doesn't have to be exactly 60 seconds. We can work with you on that one. And in between, you'll get questions from our panel, retired Admiral, former Berkeley County Commission President Bill Stubblefield, and New York Times bestselling author and retired safety engineer and former firefighter John Gilstrap. They'll ask you questions. You get a minute to two minutes for those responses as well. If during the course of a response or a point that you're making, you invoke your opponent's name or a policy, they have the right to respond uh, following the conclusion of your thought on uh, what uh, the point that you were making. Now, we will begin. We'll ask you to keep those responses, as I said, to one to two minutes, including your res direct response if your name is, uh, is brought up. Now, we will begin with opening statements. And uh, for the opening statement, we'll begin first with the incumbent Delegate Chuck Hurst. Thank you, Rob. I'd like to thank WRNR for hosting this event and uh, our audience that's watching. Uh, my name is Chuck Hurst. I'm delegate and Republican candidate for the uh, Delegate District 95th. Uh, I've been a Berkeley County resident for 50 plus years. I'm a staunch supporter of the Second Amendment, which is actually the issue that got me involved in politics originally. And if reelected, I would. Uh, I would continue to advocate for the Second Amendment, and I would advocate for uh, business policies, policies to make a better, create a better business climate in the state of West Virginia. Uh, we've, we've seen some progress there. Um, and with, our, with, with what we've seen, we've been able to reduce income tax at the state, state income tax by thus far 27 and a quarter percent. Along with that, we have also reduced the, uh, uh, or not reduced, but a refundable rebate of vehicle property tax and also a refundable rebate of 50% of small business equipment and inventory tax, which I think is a great thing uh, that helps counter um, some, some of these uh, issues that uh, where, where the state uh, courts these big corporations with money or lucrative deals to get them to come to the state. Uh, and we've also, in, in that same legislation, that was the income de reduction bill, um, we also done a rebate for um, veterans that are 100% disabled of their property tax as well. Uh, and, and, and my point to this is, is many of the policies that we have instituted over the past few years uh, since I've been in the legislature and some before, has led to much of this uh, uh, surplus money that we've had that we've been able to use for other things, uh, uh, fund, better funding. We've, we've actually funded uh, about $150 million additional every year that I've been in legislature to the roads at, 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 uh, during, in the back of the budget, uh, amongst other things. And I, I would continue to advocate for such, um, and I, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Chuck. And uh, as the incumbent, could you describe the geography of this delegate district? Uh, okay. The, could the, the you move a little closer is, to your mic, too, Chuck? The district is basically uh, everything east of Interstate 81 until you hit the uh, Potomac River and or the Opecking Creek. And it comes from the Maryland line down to uh, the city line of Martinsburg, follows the city line of Martinsburg down to Golf Course Road over to the Opecking Creek uh, the northern end of the district does go a little bit to the west of 81, but basically east of 81. Thank you very much. Now, the challenger, Debbie Carroll. Debbie, thank you for coming. Hello. My name is Debbie Carroll, and I am running for delegate, District 95. I am not a career politician, but I have been extremely active in our communities. I have been uh, leadership roles as far as uh, Roartan clubs and FFA, 4-H, uh, Scouts. I've been on the PTAs, PTOs of my child's schools. Uh, so I have been in touch with our citizens, with our neighbors, everyone, and I know I hear what they have going on in their lives, what their concerns are, and I want to be here to continue in a more, uh, how should I say it, in a role that I could possibly do more for my community than what I can at the level I'm at now. So I, I want to help our 
teachers. I, I believe that education is super important, and right now, as was said earlier in the day, uh, our schools are ranked pretty much dead last. We need to do something. It's not fair to our students, and uh, I'm here for supporting higher pay, even if it's locality pay, uh, for the teachers and for the local civil servants, and I want to improve our infrastructure. Uh, all these new houses popping up in our communities, and the roads are just not up to par to handle all the extra traffic. We need to make sure that our emergency services are equipped with enough to cover all these extra homes as well, as far as uh, ambulance, fire trucks, and uh, just police officers and that sort of thing. So I, I'm just here. I want to do the best that I can to help improve our, our communities, and I listen to our constituents, and that's what I'm here for. Thank you very much. Now, Bill, with the first question. You folks are fortunate because you've been listening, you've heard all the questions we may ask. Uh, so I've been trying to struggle for a new question. Education has been mentioned a lot of times, locality pay, our rankings, the like. As a legislator, what should the legislators do to take a comprehensive, and the emphasis is on comprehensive, not just one little small nugget, but the comprehensive review of our education system to provide some solutions to correct the problems that we face. Now, I'll start with incumbent first. Oh, thank you, Bill. Um, one, of the, one, one big part of that, I think, is, would, have, would have been uh, uh, it, it was amendment, oh, the, the amendment that would have gave the legislature oversight of the uh, state school board. And uh, that, that would have went a long ways in, in helping. Uh, quite often, we, the legislature can pass a Pass legislation, and the school board can actually state school board in their rules that do not get reviewed by the legislature can actually circumvent uh, the intent of the legislature. That that would be one issue. Um, another big issue, and, and I hear this all the time from from educators, and that is disruptive students in the classroom. We need a we need better method of dealing with disruptive students. We did have a bill this past session that did not make it through. Uh, that would that would have been a big step in, in 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 dealing with that, and then thirdly, I think another portion of the big problem with our education really is the parents slash home life of the students. Uh, you see you see so much disrespect from students uh, to to authority in the schools anymore, um, and between those three things, I think. If, if we could adjust them or, or, or get them addressed some way, shape, or form, it would make a huge difference in our outcomes and our education in the state of West Virginia. Ms. Carroll. Okay, well, those are great. I, I, I can see those ideas there, but I don't think the problem is the children's behavior. I think that a lot of our funding is mishandled, perhaps, uh, maybe too much at the top, I don't know, but when we have schools where children are sitting in the classroom and a window falls in on right out of the sill, smashes right beside them, or when we have schools where the plumbing breaks, destroys their library, uh, these things have happened in our county. Uh, we have teachers that are Told, taught, went to school to become a, let's say, a history teacher, and then they end up being a Spanish teacher because that's where they needed them. Uh, these are the issues that we need to address. We have uh, schools sharing nurses, sharing librarians. If your child gets hurt at a school on a certain day when the nurse isn't there, then the secretary is going to have to put a Band-Aid on them or, and, and call the parent to rush in and take them to care. Uh, there's just a lot of things. Um, we have so many people in our county that you don't see the differences between them. A lot of people think Berkeley County is this great county that everybody's doing so well because all these real fancy houses and stuff. But in one little school in, my, in our district alone, there was 24 homeless children in that school last year. And this is just kindergarten through second grade. Uh, we need to figure out what's going on here. I know the opioid epidemic is causing a lot of children to be taken and placed in foster care because their parents are either incarcerated or 
the children have to go live with their grandparents. But if we can address all of these issues and put more money into the teachers, helping them get more pay and helping fix the problems that are going on at the schools, at the school level, and we can worry about the children's behavior. I mean, yes, parents should probably put a little more time and effort into teaching their children respect and manners, but that's not what the problem is at our schools. You both mentioned a lot of problems, and as I think Amendment 3, Chuck, that, we're, that did not pass. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> yeah, but, it's, uh, but still, you did not get to my point. My point was doing a comprehensive review to fully understand the problem and all components of the problem. This is the one thing I think, personally, I think has been missing. But it's, uh, so anyway, I, I not follow up. That was my uh, 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 my kind of view of your response. Okay. Mr. Mr. Gilstrap? It was Amendment 4. Was it 4? <laughs> was it 4? <laughs> yes. Okay. Right. I stand corrected, Chuck. It's Amendment 4. <laughs> okay, Amendment 4. <laughs> not Amendment 2. We know it was an Amendment 2. Um, I, I want to give you another swing at, at that pitch because both of you talked about what's not working and what didn't work. Amendment 4 uh, didn't pass. A uh, bill about disruptive students didn't pass. Uh, we have problems with parents and home life. If we could control those things, that's what you said, Chuck, if we could control those things, then we could, have, we could solve part of the problem. Nowhere in there was a plan or a proposed plan for how we would start that control. Uh, Debbie, you talked about the um, issues with the physical plant collapsing on, on the kids. That's bad. Um, teachers teaching subjects that are not their own. Uh, the reality is we have a 20% chronic truism, uh, truism, uh, truant, truancy rate w throughout, throughout the state. So take another swing at that and, let, and give us an idea of what a plan would be to fix the problem. Starting Start with, with me? You. Yes. Okay, I grew up in Montgomery County, Maryland. That's probably one of the richest counties in this area. So I know a lot of the funding went to education, still does go to education. I would recommend uh, looking at what Maryland public schools are doing. And they are ranked second in the nation. We're ranked 49th or 50th, depending on which category you look at. But they're doing something right, and we're not. And a lot of it is because they are putting more funding into their education system because they have more funds. But we have a surplus too. Let's put some of that money where we can make the, bo the best use for it. Our education is one of the most important things. If we don't get the best education for our students, there's, there's no future for us here. So. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can take a swing at this. Um, certainly, money is an issue with the teachers, especially here in the Eastern Panhandle. I've been a proponent of locality pay uh, because it's not just the teacher issue. Uh, that goes across the board to our Department of Highways, all of our state employees here in the Eastern Panhandle. Our Department of Highways is literally only uh, staffed at about 40 or 50 percent here in Berkeley County. Uh, so, so that's an issue, and, and that, that issue is a matter of, of some money. Uh, I think on my website I have a statement on there that says one, one shoe doesn't fit all, or uh, basically, on, on that issue. And, and that's a fact in the state of West Virginia. Our, our, our state is so varied, uh, and the eastern panhandle is probably uh, different than all the rest of the state, uh, bar maybe uh, Morgantown area, Montegalia County. Uh, so, so that, so that th money could help that. Locality pay is the issue there, uh, and that's been a tough a tough nut to crack in the legislature because you have so many in rural counties, so many delegates, senators from rural counties that they want literally the same for for for, for their folks. Um, the bill and, and much and many of what I see as the problem and have heard is the problem with the with the children really comes down to I'm not sure how how much the state gets involved in being able to uh, address societal issues so to speak home home style type issues uh that gets uh, that gets pretty that gets pretty tough addressing that but we can and, and i believe we should address the disruptive students to remove them at least from the environment 
that where they're disrupting other students from learning. And, and that issue there is an issue that is brought up at least in the top three of every teacher I have ever talked to since I first ran for office, uh, bar, bar none. Every teacher has brought that up as a big problem in, in our education system. Right. Mr. Stubblefield. A question is asked early, and I think it's appropriate to ask it again, for a certificate of need. Are you supportive of certificate of need? And if so, should there be carve-outs? Start with you, Mr. Delegate. I am not supportive of certificate of need. I think it needs to go totally away. Uh, it, is, it is not government's role there to be dictating that, in, in my opinion. Now, with it going away, do we do it all in one final swoop? No, I don't think so. I don't think we can get there that way. I think it has to be gradual. Uh, we, di we, didn't, we probably didn't get to this point in one, one big swoop. It was, a, it was over a period of time. And I, and I think that's probably how we need to address it. And there's many issues in government that probably fall along the same line that, that I believe the government shouldn't be involved in. Uh, but one final swoop to get rid of it is probably not going to be the answer because it would be a huge shock on the industry, on the people involved. Uh, it, it would have to be incremental, I think. Debbie? I tend to agree with m much of what he's saying. Uh, right now, we need to focus on having enough doctors, especially I know Berkeley County is so much different than a lot of the other counties where it's more rural and we have so many things going on here. Um, just as an example, my daughter is having some medical issues and to get an appointment with a specialist, a pediatric specialist, to get one in Martinsburg, we had, would have had to wait until February and we ended up having to go to Morgantown. I mean, if we offered options where we could bring in more competitive doctors, you know, we may do better as far as bringing down health costs as well for everyone. Thank you. John? Just, all right, you, you brought it, it was none of my business, you brought it up, so I just, is that an insurance problem or is that an accessibility problem? Uh, well, it, uh, my insurance, I guess, covers particular doctors because it's a pediatrician specialist there okay. aren't as many in the area anyway and like i said the ones that are in this area couldn't take her in until february okay all right um i want to get to the issue of the surplus uh we've we've heard now for quite some time every, we got a billion here a billion there and whether it is actually that number or not is, is up for debate and then we talk about bad roads education issues foster care issues addiction issues poverty issues at what point do we stop being very proud of our surpluses and start spending down our surpluses and and spending the money on, on these problems? Chuck. Okay. I believe that we have done that. Most of our surpluses are usually dealt with in the back of the budget, which is uh, basically the back of the budget is where uh, things that we want to fund, we put them there, and if every – if the surplus comes to pass that we are expecting at that point, then those items get funded. And then oftentimes we'll, there will be a special session if there's more surplus money that was not spent in the back of the budget and usually gets addressed at that point there uh, via a special session as, as to where it goes. And, and like I stated, uh, since my time in the legislature, I believe it's been an additional $150 million appropriated to DOH for, for our roads every every year that I've been in the legislature, so that's uh, four, the last four years. Uh, prior to that, I'm not sure exactly how, how much may have been. I, you know, I didn't follow that closely at that point. Uh, but uh, but the surplus, it, 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 and it may be a bad word to use because surplus makes it sound like we've got this big pot of money sitting there not being used. And, and in reality, most of that has actually been dealt with in, in, in the budget, in the back of the budget, and then it gets dealt with uh, – uh, a lot of times, like in uh, July or August. It's touted as the amount of money that we didn't spend are now returning to the taxpayers for their pocket. I mean, that's, that's uh, the way it's Yes, yes, and, 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 and we're seeing right now that uh, we, we did return a bunch of that money to, to, to the people uh, via the, the tax reduction, income, state income tax reduction bill with the, uh, that addressed uh, some of the property taxes and uh, the state income tax. And what we're seeing now is we're not seeing those big surpluses forming right now that, that we have seen in the past. 
we are running right now, as far as budget goes, extremely tight when you figure we're three months into the uh, fiscal year. And I think we're only approximately $1.5 million uh, above revenue estimates. So, uh, I mean, that's literally, that's literally the razor's edge right there. Debbie? I think that the, one of the biggest issues that we are having problems with is the opioid epidemic. Uh, and that causes strain on so many different aspects of, of our lives. Uh, if we put more uh, preventative information out and more uh, centers to help address these issues, help people that are suffering, um, it would do so much for our child care, our foster care, our police system. I mean, we have so many things that we could put this money towards uh, helping our schools. I mean, I know I keep saying that because I'm a big education person. Uh, but the, the main root of a lot of our problems is the drugs. We need to get to the bottom of that. Bill. Yeah. Building upon the question that John asked, uh, especially you, Chuck, you make the distinction between the back of the budget and the front of the budget. Uh, and the front of the budget would cover such things as our the salaries or pay for our state employees, including teachers. We're continually hearing that our teachers are underpaid, our state employees are underpaid. Uh, how do you reconcile the fact they're underpaid with this continual surplus of the budget? That implies not enough is being given on the front end of the budget to compensate to be competitive in the pay. Okay, um, and again, that comes to the varied, how varied our state is, really. Uh, many of the areas of the state, teachers and highway workers, are actually uh, making pretty good wages. Uh, here in Eastern Panhandle, that doesn't hold true because of all the competition that we have with uh, Virginia, northern, especially Northern Virginia, Maryland, Hagerstown, Frederick, even Baltimore, D.C. area. Uh, and, in fact, uh, a lot of our growth initially started in this area because of being a bedroom community for those that were working uh, for the government, government and other agencies down, the, down around the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, they, 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 they liked the uh, much cheaper taxes in the state of West Virginia, and that actually started burdening our schools even more and, and uh, drove up cost of everything over time. And now we have this little island here we call the Eastern Panhandle that is totally different than pretty much the rest of the state, with the exception of perhaps uh, Montegalia County, which is having pretty, pretty decent growth as well. But Berkeley County, I believe, is the number one growth county in the state of West Virginia. And to, to uh, bring our people in this area here wages up to where they should be, if we had to do that across the state, I don't know, the budget surpluses that we had in the past would have been enough to really even do that when you're talking about statewide. That's why, uh, that's why something along the lines of some sort of a locality pay or, or a uh, uh, housing allowance for, for, say, certain areas of the state growth areas, uh, I think makes a lot of sense. Locality pay we've been talking about for 15, 20 years. I'm not sure we're much closer now than we were 15, 20 years ago. Hopefully we are. Ms. Carroll, would you care to respond? I, I sure will. I also agree we should do something about locality pay. I know everyone needs more money, but right now our teachers can go 20 miles in multiple directions and make $20,000 more per year. Same is true for our bus drivers. Every Every week I get notices in the morning, such and such bus is not operating, you know, what have you. This, we have billboards that come in from other counties advertising, come work for us, you know, this, it, it's just not, and I'm talking other counties from other states, I'm sorry, should have been more clear on that. So, yes, we, we definitely need to see if we can't get in a locality pay. You have a follow-up, Bill? No, I was going to say, uh, the, lo the response with locality pay or invoking locality pay is, to me, kind of an excuse not to look for other ways to increase the salaries. Uh, I've been hearing we'll go with locality pay for several years now. Still, our teacher salaries, our 
our employees are getting farther and farther and farther behind. Locality pay may happen. It hasn't happened. I would like to look for something that would be more meaningful than just invoking we'll get locality pay. In response to that, Chuck? I, 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 I would add that I believe that the county can fund a little bit more of that probably. I think there is method for that, for that to happen. Um, and, and just like everything else, it, it, it invokes that three-letter word that everybody hates, and that's tax. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, it, it, if, if we really want to do it, I believe some of it can be done via taxes, uh, via levies, um, on, on property tax. Of course. In, increasing the local share may be uh, an idea as well that's been talked about. Right? Uh, it's time to go to closing statements now, so we'll go in inverse order of the opening statements. So, Debbie, you'll go first on the closing statements. Okay. Well, I thank you again for having me here, and I hope that when you go to vote, you will think about everything that we need in our county that has not happened, that we've been sending our representatives up there and hoping that they're doing the right decisions that we ask them to do. We, uh, I'm here for women's rights. I know that's a big issue. No one asked me anything about that, but I'm definitely here because I think that the government does not belong in making our decisions for our personal lives. And I hope that you will remember me and I will stand for you and I am always available to listen to your concerns and get to the bottom of things. Thank you. You're welcome. And if you wanted to expand on the women's rights uh, point to, that you were, you were making, go ahead, Debbie. I'll give you another minute. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, sure. Yes. I mean, I, I just, there's just too many things going on. Uh, we have children being brought into the world that because of the mom not being able to afford another child, they're ending up in the foster care. People say, oh, well, that's okay, we'll adopt them. But there's 6,000 kids in foster care right now waiting to be adopted. We can't force a person that has been raped to carry a baby. We can't expect them to not have harsh feelings. And I know everybody wants to love their child, but when something horrible happens, you know, you can't, uh, if a, a little child is uh, a raped, do you expect her to have to carry a baby to term so I mean there's just so many things I I, I I I don't want to keep going on because I know I'm over my time now but please okay. I do uh, there's too many risks involved with women's rights uh, when there are miscarriages and that sort of thing we're losing OBGYNs because they're afraid to do procedures or anything here because they could be charged and Chuck, if you want to address any of that before you go into your opening or closing statement, go right ahead. Uh, yeah, sure. I'll, 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 I'll say something about that. Um, West Virginia, and we, and I was a part of that, did, did pass legislation that uh, restricted abortions, uh, pretty, pretty strong restrictions, I suppose. However, much of what my opponent was saying there is, is not actually restricted. There are, there are exceptions for rape, rape and incest in, in that legislation. Um, I, I personally was against that, but but it, but that's what the consensus was of, of the House and, and the legislature. Um, and the, the very idea that uh, that a miscarriage cannot be dealt with by a, a physician is just ludicrous. I mean, it's uh, and and we often hear also that uh, 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 we put the life of the mother at risk uh, because uh, 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 a doctor won't do a certain procedure. Uh, because it could be classed as an abortion, which which is also false. Uh, any 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 time the mother's life is in danger, the mother's life is is first and foremost. The the fetus would be secondary. So if if it, if it required an abortion to save the mother's life, that would a absolutely be appropriate at that point. But the but the onus is actually it's always to protect life is to try to protect the fetus. But if that's not vi viable or feasible, well, then uh, an abortion would be would be acceptable in those circumstances. If you want to move into your closing statement, go right ahead. Or if that serves as your okay, closing sure. statement, yeah, that's yeah, up to yeah, you. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I'd just like to let everybody know I'm very liberty-minded. Um, and, and what I mean by liberty-minded is less government is better. Uh, however, since getting elected, I have also realized that sometimes you just can't 
go back to where I'd like to see things. Uh, and, and I mentioned that a little bit ago uh, with uh, certificate of need. Uh, when, when, when you have people relying on what the laws currently are and then to just strike something all the way out is generally not feasible. So I'm a real li realist when it comes to that, and I, would, I, I support moving towards those type goals of less government, less government intrusion. Um, and on my website, uh, charleshorst.com, that's H-O-R-S-T, uh, there's a little more information there about things that I have stood for in the past during, since I've been in the legislature and some issues that I'm working on right now that are that I consider liberty type issues. Uh, some description of them that's a little bit too long to go through here in closing statement for sure. Uh, but, but I would encourage those that, that are curious to take a look at my website and, and, and learn a little bit about some liberties that have been taken away from you that most people are not even aware of. Uh, so, again, I, I ask for your consideration for your vote, and my website is charleshorst.com. That's H-O-R-S-T. And look me up on Facebook. I'm very active on Facebook. Thank you. Thank you both very much, and uh, I would encourage you both to come back on the show again before Election Day. I think there was some more stuff you wanted to say there, uh, too, Debbie. We could certainly get to that in a more expanded format on the show before Election Day. Uh, both of you, best of luck to you. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be back.